Good morning. Welcome to the Lord's house for worship this morning. Through Christ, we are completely forgiven of all sin. By His Spirit, our lives are being transformed, but we are not perfect. Not yet. And that's our theme for today. We are forgiven, but not perfect, as we continue looking at the teachings of the, and the blessings of the Lutheran Reformation. The order of service that will guide our worship today is service of the Word, which begins on page 38 in the front portion of the hymnal. We'll begin this morning by watching our section of the, the Reformation video, and then we'll join together in the opening hymn, hymn number 378. In the Middle Ages, the future for those condemned as heretics was bleak. In the 1400s, Jan Hus had criticized the church much as Luther had and was burned at the stake. And now, followers of Luther like John Esch and Henry Voss faced the ultimatum. Recant or die. Both were burned alive because they would not deny their Lutheran faith. Esch and Voss never did recant. They refused to recant, and then they were led back to Brussels, where they were burned at the stake because they did not recant. Avoid those who search for your soul in a money bag. A similar fate was always looming for Martin Luther, but it did not slow his work. His faith drove him forward, a faith defined as simple trust in the promise of God in Scripture, the promise that God forgives sinners fully and completely because of Christ. That's the grace alone, faith alone, Scripture alone. Cling to the Scriptures because there I have certainty, not in my feelings, Luther and the other Wittenberg reformers understood that trusting God's assurance of forgiveness was not a license to do evil or abandon good works. Believers do good works not to earn God's favor, but because they are grateful that God freely forgives and promises eternal life. Yet, even forgiven people don't stop sinning. Believers who trust God's forgiveness still have their faults and failures. You have to recognize your sin in order to really appreciate uh, what God ha has done for you. So Luther is not suggesting that we ignore sin. It, it's it's necessar necessary that we recognize our sinfulness in order to fully appreciate what God has done for us. Thus, sin daily disturbs us, hindering our way and even tormenting us so that unless it is courageously cleared away, we will thrust ourselves against it and will stumble. Indeed, it is an evil guest, and yet it dwells within us, in our flesh. Christians in every era struggle against sin, repent of it daily, and then resolve to live as God demands. True faith trusts Christ and rejoices in his righteousness that is credited to the sinner. So it is a radical and fundamental shift in thinking that God declares us right because of Jesus and that he accepts us then as his children because of that righteousness. Luther trusted the gifts God gives sinners by grace through faith, a gift that is more important than even life itself. For where there is such faith and confidence, there is also a bold, defiant, fearless heart that risks all and stands by the truth, 
no matter what the cost. For such a heart is satisfied and serenely sure that it has a gracious, kindly disposed God. Please stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love Him and to serve Him as His dear children. But we have disobeyed Him and deserve only His wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to Him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. 
but trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray. Have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all of your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Let us pray. Mercifully grant, O Lord, that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts. For without your help, we are unable to please you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated. Our first lesson for today is taken from the Apostle Paul's letter to the Romans, Romans chapter 7, verses 7 through 25. This is also the portion of God's Word that we will meditate on during the sermon today. We read, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. Indeed, I would not have known what sin was except through the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, Do not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of covetous desire. For apart from law, sin is dead. Once I was alive apart from law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. For sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me, and through the commandment put me to death. So then, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, righteous and good. Did that which is good then become death to me? By no means. But in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it produced death in me through what was good so that through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do, no, the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner to the law of sin at work within my members. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? 
Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself, in my mind, am a slave to God's law, but in the sinful nature, I'm a slave to the law of sin. This is the word of the Lord. We respond to God's word today by joining together in our psalm. It's psalm number one, found on page 64 in the front part of the hymnal. We'll sing the psalm in unison. Please stand for the reading of the Gospel lesson. Our Gospel lesson for today is taken from Luke's Gospel, the 22nd chapter, beginning with the 54th verse. Here we see Peter as an example of what it means for us to be forgiven, but not yet perfect. We read, Then seizing him, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. But when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, This man was with him. But he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted, Certainly this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. Peter replied, Man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. This is the gospel of our Savior, Jesus Christ. You may be seated. Children, at this time you're invited to come forward to hear the children's message. more are coming.
Good morning, children. Take a look at this picture. See it, Micah? There are some men on that side and some men on that side. They're all hanging on to a rope. What are they doing? What do we call this? Brooklyn, what do we call it? Tug of war. These men are pulling in that direction. The men over here are pulling in that direction against each other. Here's another little simple picture. There are just two people, each holding an end of the rope, and they're pulling in opposite directions. You think it's kind of kind of tough and tiring to play tug of war? Can be. God teaches us in the Bible that inside of each one of us there's a tug of war going on all the time. There's, there's a part of you and a part of me that really doesn't care about Jesus at all. That part of you and that part of me doesn't want to do anything that Jesus says, but just the opposite. But then, there's another part of you and me and each one of us, and it's really the greater part, that part loves Jesus because he died for us and rose again. That part of you and me wants always to do what Jesus says. But the problem is there's that other part that's always pulling in the other way. Inside of you and me every day, there's this tug of war going on between those two parts of us. It can get really, really tiring. That's why we're so thankful, like Pastor Yankee said, we're not perfect, we're far from perfect, but we're always forgiven because of what Jesus did on the cross for you and me. Oh, we're so thankful and so happy that Jesus forgives us all of our sins. And that means that we keep fighting in this tug of war all the time because we don't want that side of us that hates Jesus. We don't want that side of us to win. We want the side of us that loves Jesus always to win in this tug of war. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we're so thankful to you that you forgive all of our sins. Help us every day as we fight in this tug of war with that side of us that doesn't like you and doesn't want to do what you command. Give us peace always in knowing that you have forgiven all of our sins. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks, children. Our next hymn is printed out on the last page of your service folder.
grace to each of you from our dear Savior Jesus. We meditate on the section that was the first lesson today from Romans chapter 7. Dear fellow forgiven children of God, some people are afflicted with the psychological condition called split or multiple personality disorder. You're probably familiar with it. In this condition, a person has multiple personalities in their psyche or in their mind, and those multiple personalities are at odds with each other, always vying for control. What a dreadful condition to have. Every one of us and every believer in Jesus, in a way, has multiple or split personality disorder. Not psychologically, but spiritually. Martin Luther put it this way. We are sinners and saints at the same time. Let's ask our good Lutheran question now. What does this mean? Every one of us is a sinner. Flesh born of flesh. As you know, that's not how God made people. In the beginning, God created people in his image, in his likeness, as the triune God declared on, on the sixth day of creation, let us make man in our image and in our likeness so male and female, God created them. They were in God's image, totally holy, perfectly righteous. What they wanted was exactly what God wanted. And what God wanted is exactly what they always did. They perfectly love God. They perfectly loved one another. Doing what God commands was their absolute delight. God's image was lost, though, with the first sin. Adam and Eve believed the devil's lies and half-truths and ceased to be in God's image or in God's likeness. And the proof then abounded, the proof as to their new condition. When God came seeking them out in the garden, they ran away from him and hid. Then they made up excuses for their sin. They no longer loved each other as husband and wife as they had before. Moses gives us an indication of how much they changed when he writes about Adam and his descendants. Adam had sons in his likeness and in his image, no longer in God's likeness and in God's image. Now, all of this is not merely theoretical. All of this is very personal because every one of us is flesh born of flesh. This sinful condition was present in us from the very beginning at the moment of conception. Our Lord Jesus says, flesh gives birth to flesh. King David confessed for himself and for you and me, I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. That sinful nature, the flesh, was as much a part of us as our genetic code when we were conceived inside of our mothers. And that flesh is active. Paul says, nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. Sin, he says, was living inside of him. Because of sin living inside of us, our motives are often impure. Because of sin living inside of us, our words are not always so God-pleasing. Because of sin living inside of us, being very active all the time, we're often drawn in a direction away from God's commandments. Every one of us today has already felt the pull of the flesh living inside of us. When companies that sell weight loss, or health improvement, put out their campaigns. Sometimes they have a slogan like this. Become the new you. Turn a corner, 
Put that old you in the past and become the new you. Every one of us has a new you in Christ. Every one of us has the new person living inside of us. That new person was not inside of us when we were conceived. That new person was given to us when we were baptized. At our baptism, God just poured on us blessing after blessing. God's Spirit gave to us the righteousness, the holiness, the perfection of Jesus, credited to us as a gift. We were clothed in the righteousness of Christ. At our baptism, we were personally justified, declared not guilty of sin because of Jesus. At our baptism, we were made saints, holy people in the eyes of God because we were fully forgiven of all sin when we were united with Jesus in the waters of baptism. And at baptism, you became a new you. God gave to you the new person. Two passages in the New Testament speak most directly to this fact. Ephesians 4.24 says, You were taught to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Colossians 3 verse 10 says, You have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Through the power of God's word, God's image is being restored in us every day. We have that new person, the new person that absolutely delights in doing what God commands, the new person inside of us that doesn't have to be told what's pleasing to God, but but knows and wants to do it always. As the Apostle Paul says in Romans 7, in my inner being, I delight in God's law. That new person is inside of each one of us. That new person is a precious gift given to us by Christ. We are saints in the eyes of God through faith in Jesus. At the same time, though, we are still sinners. This fact is the source of an exhausting struggle. Inside of us, as inside of the Apostle Paul, there are competing desires. Listen again to what he said. I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do, no, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Conflict, struggle, battle constantly back and forth between the old person, the flesh, and the new person given to us by God at baptism. It's sort of like two groups of soldiers who are fighting for the same piece of real estate, the same hill. Both sides want that hill. One side holds the hill, the other side charges the hill and drives off the other force, but then the other force comes back and reclaims the hill. Then the other force drives them back again, takes the hill for themselves, but then the other force comes back, back and forth, struggling back and forth over that same piece of real estate. That's what's going on inside of each of us daily. The struggle, the conflict between the flesh and the new person. We humbly admit before God that There are many losses in this conflict. What the Apostle says here is just so pertinent to each one of us. He describes how sin inside of us loves to take advantage of God's law. God's law, his holy Ten Commandments, are good, and they are perfect, and they are right, and we love them. But sin inside of us sees God's commandments as opportunities for sin. It's sort of like saying to a child, don't do this, but then the child is tempted to do exactly what the child is forbidden to do. Inside of us, our flesh, when it hears God's command, sort of says, oh yeah? Well, watch me just break that commandment. And it goes ahead and breaks the commandment. 
and we are ashamed of ourselves because we give in to that sin. That's the struggle we face so often. Every one of God's commands can become an opportunity for the flesh inside of us to do battle against the new person. Let's just take a few examples. How about obedience to those in authority, toward parents, toward government, toward leaders in the church? In our inner being, we delight in that commandment, and we want to show obedience to those in authority, but then the flesh inside of us takes that commandment as an opportunity to sin and steers us away from obedience to disobedience. God commands us to practice self-control not to become trapped and ensnared by anger, not to express ourselves in anger, but to express ourselves in kind, loving, and patient words. And we want to practice self-control. But then the flesh inside of us incites us to say things we don't want to say, we shouldn't say, and to become just downright angry. God's sixth commandment teaches us that we are to live pure and decent lives and words and actions and that husbands and wives are to love and honor each other. And, and we want to practice sexual purity and to love our spouses as God commands. But, but the flesh looks for ways to get around that commandment and to dishonor God through sexual immorality. God commands us to be content with whatever he's given to us. To be happy with the material possessions we have, the gifts and the talents that God has given to us as individuals. But sin loves to covet and tries to get us always to think about what somebody else has and wanting to have it for ourselves. As the Apostle says, I wouldn't have known what coveting was except God's law exposes all my covetous desires. And let's go to a really big one. God commands us to trust in him above all things because God is perfectly trustworthy. Yet where do we find ourselves so often, if not daily? Failing to trust him, worrying, getting anxious, and essentially trusting in ourselves. The struggle goes on day after day, back and forth, as these two opposing forces do battle against one another. This is how the Apostle Paul summarized all this. I myself, in my mind, he's talking about his new person, in my mind, am a slave to God's law, but in the sinful nature of the flesh, a slave to the law of sin. How tiring, how exhausting this is to do battle with sin day after day. We say along with the Apostle Paul, what a wretched person I am. This is not the way I want to be. This is not what I want to do. But the struggle goes on. And we ask along with the Apostle Paul, who will rescue me from this body of death? He knew the answer. So do you. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Christ has rescued us from this body of death. In whatever way that we lose in this struggle, Christ triumphed. In whatever way that you and I fail, Christ always prevails. Let's dwell on Jesus and how he dealt with the temptations to do what is wrong. First of all, we remind ourselves that Christ had no flesh inside of him. He had no sinful nature because he is the eternal holy son of God. Yet Christ was tempted. And as the Bible teaches us, he was tempted in every way just as we are. And when he was tempted, he suffered. Christ faced those forces from the outside in the sinful world around him. And he faced temptation from the old evil foe in many ways that you and I probably will never face. Christ, though, always prevailed. 
when it comes to the fourth commandment, he always obeyed his parents. He perfectly obeyed those in authority in the church and in the government. Christ did sometimes become angry, but it was always righteous anger with no sin at all. Christ had perfect thoughts always toward those of the opposite gender. He honored those who were in marriage in all that he said and in all that he did. Christ was perfectly content with the lot in life that his heavenly Father gave to him, not coveting, not wanting to have more, even though the devil tempted him, that he would give him all the kingdoms of the world. Christ said no. And in the biggest ways of all, Christ perfectly trusted his heavenly Father in every situation. Christ triumphed. Now relate that to yourself. In the struggles that you dealt with yesterday and in the failures that you confessed before God and his altar this morning, Christ was triumphant in your place. In whatever way we fail, Christ prevailed. Christ triumphed for us. And then Christ took the guilt of all sin all the, all the guilt of our original sin, the flesh living inside of us, all the guilt of the sins that we commit day after day, Christ took all the guilt on himself and suffered for it to the max when he gave his life on the cross. Now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Justified through faith in Jesus, we have peace with God through him and through him alone. We are fully forgiven of all sin, through Christ. How comforted we are in our struggles. Whenever we fail, Christ prevails. Whenever we fail, we are forgiven through Jesus and through Jesus alone. As you struggle and wrestle with sin inside of you, tell yourself all the time, I am failing again but I am forgiven through Christ who was active in doing good in my place and who took my guilt to the cross. I am fully forgiven through Jesus. Before, during, and after the struggle, tell yourself that gospel fact again and again. Even though I am far from perfect, even though I am sinner and Satan struggling at the same time, I am forgiven through Jesus. Thank God. Now let's deal with a lie. There's a part of each one of us then that wants to conclude, I'm forgiven. So then what I do doesn't really matter. If I sin, I'm forgiven by Jesus. Well, I'll be forgiven anyway. So why should I really expend all this energy in struggling against sin? You've heard that voice, so have I, very often. Let's identify it for what it is. It is a lie from Satan. This is the gospel fact. We are fully forgiven through Jesus, so the conclusion is not, then we can just sort of sin with impunity. The conclusion then is, we keep struggling against sin. If you were stranded out in the ocean somewhere, waiting for the rescue boat or the rescue plane to arrive, you'd be treading water like you've never treaded water in your life. If you told yourself, well, the rescue boat is coming, the rescue plane is coming, so I can just stop treading water and I'll be fine, who would want to do that? It's really the same, but only more serious when it comes to the struggle with sin. Sadly and tragically, way too many believers in Jesus have stopped struggling against sin and the devil eventually snatched away their faith in Jesus. Not a game to play with our faith in Christ. So we keep struggling against sin. 
We keep nurturing and feeding that new person inside of us with God's Word and with the sacrament so that we are assured of God's forgiveness and empowered more and more to keep fighting against sin. And over time, there are more victories and fewer losses in this struggle against sin. Over time, we are getting the upper hand more and more against the flesh inside of us and rejoicing in the victories that Christ gives. And we keep struggling, always looking ahead to what is to come. The time will come when we will no longer be sinner and saint at the same time, but only saint. In heavenly glory, when we are in the presence of God, the flesh will be gone, and all of our desires will always be holy and perfect, and better yet, we will always carry them out to the glory of God and in the peace that Jesus gives. How wonderful that will be forever and ever serving Jesus perfectly. We look ahead to what is coming, and then now, we keep taking up that struggle against sin. Because as long as we are here, we will be sinners and saints at the same time. Fully forgiven through Christ and his holy blood shed on the cross. But not yet perfect. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God that we have in Christ will guard our hearts and our minds in our Savior. Amen. Together, let's confess our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We show our love for Christ by giving him our offerings. Please sign our Trinity Friendship Register. You'll find it in the blue binder at the end of your pew. Thy bounties thus, as stewards, true receive, and gladly as thou blessed us, to thee our first fruits give. Amen. Please turn to page 42 in the front portion of the hymnal and let us join together in the responsive prayer of the church. Lord God, our maker and preserver, we praise and thank you for all that you give us day after day. You have given us your precious word to nourish our souls and to protect us from the temptations of the devil, the world, and our sinful nature. Heavenly Father, we pray that you shield us from every kind of danger, sudden catastrophe, terrors of crime, and the pain of disease. Watch over those who travel by land, sea, and air. Keep our loved ones from whatever perils may threaten them. Bless our land, our people, and those who hold offices of high trust. Keep our government and schools upright and strong for the advancement of good citizenship and useful vocations, that we may enjoy your gifts of peace, security, and well-being. Amen. 
Lord, accept our thanks and praise for the blessing you have given to Tim and Jenny Caves in the birth of their daughter, Michaela. Bless this child, Michaela, and receive her into your family through the sacrament of holy baptism. Protect her from all dangers of body and soul and give her parents, Tim and Jenny, the love, wisdom, and means to care for this child you have entrusted to their care. We bring these requests before you in the name of Jesus our Lord and ask you to hear us. Take all that we have, our bodies and minds, our time and skills, our ministries and offerings, and use them to your glory. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. O Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation. And bestow on us your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in, a, live in harmony with one another and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. You may be seated as we join together in our final hymn. Good morning once again. Good to see all of you here this morning. Our pleasure to share God's Word with you today. Um, looking inside the, the worship folders, a couple of announcements I wanted to point out to you. Uh, first of all, the October edition of um, Ford and Christ is in, so if you subscribe to that, you can pick those up out, out in the fireside room. Um, also, we have an issue that we're, we're talking through in our school board, and, and it has to do with our school concerning being involved in the Wisconsin Parental Choice Program. 
There are a number of meetings that we've been hosting, and I have not brought them to your attention from, from this forum any, uh, anyway. Um, they snuck up on us. There are a couple of meetings left. Uh, they're the same meetings. You can attend them either at, either at St. Luke's School, or we have another one coming up here on October 29th at 1145. So if you have any questions about what being involved in that program would mean for our school or for our families, we invite you to attend and to give your input. Um, those are all the announcements I have. Pastor Brower has one. One more reminder, we have the small catechism devotional reading plan that went out in the newsletter for October. If you perhaps maybe misplaced that or if you didn't get your newsletter, there are more copies. I see Russ with a stack there who's willing to hand them out if you'd like to take one on your way out. It's not too late in the month of October to start this and really you could do it any time you would choose. It's a simple way of reading through the small catechism over the course of 28 days and then offering prayers from your heart on all these different parts of the catechism. So please take advantage of this. Those are all the announcements. May the Lord bless your day.